Good morning. We want to get you up to date with some breaking news from the Department of Health. They're holding a press conference right now regarding vaping-related illnesses. Let's listen in. Details on this. And first is that uh, vaping is not safe. It's um, it's been um, reported to be associated with uh, over 2,000 cases of lung disease today, and over 40 deaths have been attributed to vaping. Um, our advice is basically do not use e-cigarettes or vaping devices uh, of any kind. Based on the vape, vaping history of the cases, we've, we've, um, we have some more specific recommendations, and that is that you certainly should not be vaping uh, products that contain THC, that's the active ingredient in marijuana, or um, products that contain vitamin E and acetate. That's also been found in most of the cases where we've been able to identify uh, 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 agents that might be associated with these uh, illnesses. But those are probably not all of what we're concerned about. It may be a combination of these, these substances, or there may be other substances that are also uh, hazardous. But it's certainly... Uh, 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 safe to say that vaping is not safe and it should not be encouraged. If you must choose or must use vaping devices, you shouldn't be using off-market devices uh, or, or substances. Uh, uh, anything off the street you, that you purchase on the internet or from friends is probably not safe to vape. Uh, who knows where those products come from, and uh, we strongly recommend avoiding those. Pregnant women should not be vaping at all, and the same applies to children. Uh, children's metabolism is different than adults. They're much more vulnerable to um, uh, any agent that might uh, cause adverse health effects, and we simply don't know what the short-term or long-term effects are from vaping. So um, those are the major uh, recommendations we want to to um, to make. Um, let me uh, ask uh, Al Bronstein, Dr. Bronstein, to to uh, cover some of the um, other information that we have now on the cases, and and, uh, and he can lay out again what um, some of the concerns are. Okay, thank you. So this this illness is a the illness predominantly seventy plus percent are males that have been reported to the CDC and most of them are less than age of 35. So it's a young person's illness, and it can start out with very vague symptoms. It can be like a cough, uh, some symptoms of maybe bronchitis, and it can seem very, 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 very simple, and people have gone to the emergency department or to clinics, and it was thought it was a simple uh, upper respiratory a uh, condition and they received treatment but they did not uh, get better what we have happening here is that the lungs which are like two big air sponges contain little air sacs and these sacs are very very thin and through these air sacs oxygen goes in carbon dioxide comes out so in the case of the marijuana combination plus the vitamin E acetate, these compounds, we believe, destroy the air sacs. And when the air sacs get destroyed, then fluids can go into the lungs and cause problems. Some of the fluids contain fats, and so that is maybe the cause of what's been described to be lipoid a pneumonia or say to be fatty pneumonia. And of course when the air sacs are destroyed, people can't breathe. And if one does a chest x-ray, which normally looks black on the x-ray, it's all white. And so they can't breathe. They can't ventilate themselves. They can't oxygenate themselves. So that's the problem. And it takes a few days to set this up. It doesn't happen just instantaneously. Many of the times people report they've been using these compounds. And we really don't know for sure all the culprits. There are many different chemicals in the vaping aerosols, from formaldehyde to heavy metals. And so we really don't know how all of these interreact, 
with what's the primary reason to vape, say for marijuana, and the active ingredient is THC, or the vitamin E acetate, which is used to thicken the fluid. And uh, vitamin E acetate, by the way, is used in many compounds as a, to a scavenge for free radicals, but that's in creams and lotions and such. It's typically not used to breathe in. So anyway, I don't think we know exactly the total cause of this. Certainly the marijuana and vitamin E acetate seem to be the riskiest, followed by marijuana plus nicotine are also risky. And there are cases that have been reported of people just using nicotine and develop this lung disease. So that is the basis for that we really cannot recommend this method to anyone, especially pregnant people and uh, children. So that's where we are right now, I think, as the days progress, we'll continue to learn more about the mechanism. But right now, we have identified some possible culprits, and it appears that this form of use of either THC or nicotine is not safe. Thanks. You know, I, I failed to... Uh, to explain why we were here today in large part, and that is that we've had two, two new cases. Let me, let me uh, get that out, and then we can answer some. Uh, Lola would also like to talk about uh, some of the uh, other risk factors here. We have two new cases of uh, serious lung disease reported in Hawaii. Uh, that makes a total of four cases we've seen so far that have been associated with vaping. All of these cases have a history of vaping THC, marijuana. Uh, which is consistent with what we're seeing nationally. Two of the cases are adults, two are children, um, which is again consistent with uh, national statistics. And we have about a half dozen or so cases um, that we're still investigating um, that have been reported. We have yet to confirm those cases. But today we have a total of four cases in Hawaii. So with that, let me uh, pass on the microphones here to, to Lola and she can a few more things about the vaping epidemic here in Hawaii. Okay, thank you. Um, so I appreciate the media really um, inquiring about the youth vaping rates because we have received questions. And yes, in the 2017 Youth Behavioral Risk Survey, we did note that Hawaii's rate of 26% of high school students saying they regularly use e-cigarettes was double that of the national rate. And on the neighbor islands, it's about a third of high school students saying they regularly use e-cigarettes. We're waiting for the 2019 data results, and um, as we looked at some preliminary results, um, it will be higher. We also know from national data that youth who start using e-cigarettes with nicotine are more likely to also then experiment with THCs. And so we're really concerned because as we see in the national trends, the youngest of the lung injury patients was 13 years of age. And we have heard of and we have had reported to us elementary level students who are using e-cigarettes. And so this is of grave concern and we do want parents, teachers, any, anyone who's involved with children to have that conversation with youth, with children, with students to find out what they know and to have the conversation about the hazards of e-cigarettes. And so um, in terms of how to talk to youth, we do have um, just some startup conversation starters on hawaiinovape.com that parents and educators can go to. hawaiinovape.com has information for parents and educators so that they can start having those conversations. We also then have had um, workshops with the Stanford Tobacco Prevention Toolkit, which is an evidence-based toolkit for all of the school systems in Hawaii. That would be the Department of Education, the Charter Commission, and the Hawaii Association of Independent Schools. So administrators, faculty, and staff members have all had training that and they have access to the toolkit, which is online. 
We also have um, put out grants, and so starting January 2020, we will have more capacity at the community level with also nonprofit organizations getting trained in the Stanford Pre Prevention Toolkit. So we appreciate your time and attention to the matter because we are also concerned and we want to assure that our children have the healthiest future possible. They should not start their adult lives with lung injury that can be prevented. And so we will also have a health communication strategy out there in 2020 with youth prevention messages for youth. And so we're going to be aggressive about it, and it's part of a comprehensive mix when we talk about prevention to also have policy um, as part of that. We know that in Hawaii it works. We had a 71% reduction in youth smoking rates as a result of a comprehensive approach to smoking. Unfortunately, our youth have equated vaping as safe, and we want them to know, as Dr. Anderson has said, it is not safe. And so we want our youth to not use e-cigarettes. Anyone under age 21 years of age, it is illegal for them to purchase and it is illegal for them for retailers to sell to anyone under age 21 years of age of any tobacco products. So thank you. Thank you for being part of helping our youth start healthy and live long quality years of life. Glad to answer any questions. Let me let me um, add a couple of things that I forgot to mention um, as it related to these cases we're having in Hawaii. Um, I mentioned the, um, all the cases uh, we've seen have a history of, of, of um, vaping, THC, marijuana, essentially. Um, all of those cases were hospitalized with serious lung illness. They've all recovered. Fortunately, uh, that's not the case nation nationally. We've had over 40 people die from lung injuries, but uh, we haven't had anyone here. But the individuals uh, experience shortness of breath, gastrointestinal symptoms, weakness, and, a, and three reported fever and at least two reported ch having chest pains. Those are the symptoms we typically see from, from patients. Again, this is consistent with what, what's being seen nationally, where we have over 2,000 cases of serious illness associated with vaping. These are individuals who have gone to the hospital because they have life-threatening conditions. It's not to say that these are the only cases we've had. There are probably lots of people out there who have had symptoms and experienced uh, problems associated with vaping that aren't going to see physicians, and they're certainly not going to a hospital. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is the tip of the iceberg we're seeing now, and we certainly don't know what's going to be happening years from now as more and more people are vaping and they're vaping longer. <clears throat> so don't vape, it's not safe, and um, um, be aware of what, what the risks are to you and, and your friends who are with you when you're vaping. Bruce, yeah. the two latest cases that you've had, is E-acetate involved in those? And really in the four cases that we've had here in Hawaii, has the E-acetate come up in those? Do you know the question? That's that. I, I, we don't know. Um, e acetate's a, um, a thickener that's often added uh, to THC to make it in, in a form that can be vaped. Um, we simply don't have that information. Many of the samples that we're collecting are going back to the Centers for Disease Control for further analysis, and it's possible they will find uh, vitamin E acetate when they do that analysis. Uh, we only know the, the history as reported by those individuals, which is that they were uh, vaping THC. The handful of cases that you are investigating now, mm -hmm. or looking at now, are any of those people hospitalized or present? I, uh, I don't. I don't know the status of those. Uh, there are um, about a half dozen or so that are are under investigation. Does it split? It's, it's typically. <laughs> The cases are typically hospitalized when we when we get the reports. Um, we, there's probably a lot of illness out there that, that's recognized earlier than that, but 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 the 2,000 cases that we're hearing about nationally have all been hospitalized cases. So that's where we're that's where we're we're going with with uh, with that. Safe to assume that these six people then, or half dozen or so people, were hospitalized and have come out of the hospital now. So. I really don't know the history on the uh, where we are on the investigation of the other cases, but 
there are other cases besides the four that we've confirmed that are uh, associated with vaping. All right, you were listening to the Department of Health giving an update there on the recent added additional cases of vaping-related illness. They're talking about the two additional cases, bringing the total number up to, I believe you said, four. All right, let's get you over to another developing story right now in Salt Lake. In Salt Lake, we've had a barricade situation unfolding all morning. We're going to go out live to Chelsea Davis. Hey, Chelsea, what's the latest you're seeing out there from the scene? What can you tell us? We just want to give you a better idea of where we are. We're on Likini Street in Salt Lake. And as you can see behind me, a very large police presence are here on scene. A uniformed police officers as well as HPD's Specialized Services Division, also known as their SWAT team, are here for reports of a man barricaded inside a home that's on Likini Street with a gun. Now, our sources do tell us that they're are three hostages inside it's unclear at this point if anyone has been injured we are still waiting on official word from police officials but again a man is barricaded inside a home on Likini Street with a gun sources say there are at least three people inside with him now Likini Street and Wanaka streets are closed while police try to defuse this situation we have seen officers walking around um, with canine units as well it's unclear at this point if any evacuations have taken place but we do know that no vehicles are being allowed in or out of this area now we are working to get confirmation as i mentioned from police officials about who this man is how this all started but definitely a very tense situation for the residents here on likini street and wanaka street but stay with hawaii news now online and on air for the very latest on this developing story that's all i have out here in salt lake reporting live i'm chelsea davis for hawaii news now back to you all right thank you very much chelsea thank you chelsea for that report we're going to get you over to Washington now. We're going to take a live look at Washington where day two of hearings have just wrapped up and we're going to get you over to our reporter who just filed this report from the hearings from inside and let's hear what they have to say. President Trump did not hold back Chelsea, during clear. Ambassador Marie Ivanovich's testimony at today's impeachment inquiry hearing. He tweeted, everywhere Marie Ivanovich went turned bad, adding, it is a U.S. president's absolute right to appoint ambassadors. Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney responded, saying Ambassador Ivanovich clearly is somebody who's been a public servant to the United States for decades, and I don't think the president should have done that. This Democrats took it a step further. We take this kind of witness intimidation and obstruction of inquiry very seriously. Yovanovitch, the former ambassador to Ukraine, says she was shocked when she read the July 25th call summary in which President Trump told Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky that she was, quote, bad news and would be going through some things. She's going to go through some things. It didn't sound good. It sounded like a threat. Just as the hearing with Yovanovitch began, President Trump released a call summary of his first phone conversation with Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky. Republicans read the summary of that call into the record. It was on the night of Zelensky's election victory and made no mention of political investigations. I'd like to invite you to the White House. We'll have a lot of things to talk about. The summary released this morning did not include talk of rooting out corruption, but that was on a readout of the call the White House released in April. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Let's get you outside. Check it out. It's beautiful. Aloha Friday. Surf's up, but there is some chance of some wet weather out there. Here's Guy Hoggy with an update. Happy Aloha Friday. I'm Guy Hoggy with your HawaiiNewsNow.com forecast. We're looking at a squishy weekend. Two sources of moisture uh, approaching the state. One is this front going to come into Kauai later today. Maybe some prefrontal showers before then. And then there's a disturbance off to the southeast. That's going to approach the Big Island later today as well. So on the tips, that's where we'll see the showers today on the Big Island as well as on Kauai. Uh, already Kauai seeing some of those prefrontal showers. But for Oahu and for Maui County, we won't see much of the rain until 
until tomorrow. So there's the front and there's the disturbance. They will converge on the state probably through tomorrow. Now for tomorrow morning, it looks like the better part of the day should be fairly dry for uh, Oahu and for Maui County, but very wet for the Big Island and for Kauai. Now as the day progresses into the afternoon in through Sunday, look for increasing clouds, increasing showers. Some of the showers could even develop into thunderstorms with some heavy downpours. That's going to be the case probably all the way into Monday, maybe to some extent Tuesday. Notice how the moisture just sticks around the state, doesn't move around very much. Also keep in mind that trade winds are going to be filling in once that front pulls away. So it looks like we're in for a damp and squishy weekend. Not so much today, although the Big Island and Kauai likely to see some showers. And then there's a possibility for some heavy rain, maybe even a few thunderstorms, but not widespread Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And then Tuesday, back to a few more showers with a drier conditions moving in by the middle of next week. Now, as far as the surf, it's going to be big. It's going to be elevated. This swell is on the way down. It's more of a northerly direction, but still it's good enough. The Hawaiian Pro is in the water. They'll do, they're duking it out for the Triple Crown. Much smaller on the west side because of the direction of the swell, which is more north. But a bigger northwesterly swell is due in by tomorrow. So for the weekend, well, we're seeing fair skies today. And again, get ready for some thunderstorms uh, for the next couple of days after that. We'll have more details on air and online. Okay, so just to clarify, it's Friday and we're talking football? There's nothing better than that. Friday and football. Football Fridays. Now oh, I know why that, we call it that's that. How we Is that why we call it that? <laughs> that makes sense. Kaido and Carl said, okay, so the last couple of weeks we talked about postseason, we talked about playoffs. That was for OIA and ILH. Now it's states, right? This is what football is all about. You build in the summer, you know, you skip the beach session with the boys to cruise to get to practice, to hit the weight room, to get to the state tournament. This is what it's all about. These players is going to be a great couple of weekends of high school ball. Okay, so let's break it down. Division two and division one. Start with division two. So division two, Kamehameha Hawaii is going to welcome Roosevelt. Uh, Kamehameha Hawaii is 10 and 3 on the season. They got an offense that averages 34 points a game, gives up just 14. Keep this in mind too, Kamehameha Hawaii only losses this season to Iolani and Hilo, teams in the Division 1. Uh, when you take a look at Roosevelt, I mean Skyler Ogata, 22 passing touchdowns. He's been sensational all year. So Lahaina Luna is going to get the number one seed in the Division 2 bracket. They played great all season. Kapa and Kaimoki are going to battle in the other semi. Jaden Maiava, that dude is just an absolute baller. 36 touchdowns this season, just six interceptions. Their offense averages 36 points a game. But Kapa is 7-1 and one this year. Their defense has been pretty good. They've got four shutouts on the season. But I don't know if they've seen a kid like Jaden Maiava, so that game's going to be really good in Division 2. Heading over now to Division 1, that's actually going to be the first game of the state tournament. That's going down tonight. Baldwin is going to host Lelehua. Lele who is going to come into that game. Keep this in mind, their only losses on the season, both to Moana Lua. They pretty much ran through the OIA Division I. Kekoa Tarangan, 21 touchdown passes, but the Mules' defense is what really powers these guys. Three shutouts this season. On average, they gave up just 12 points a game. It's insane. I've seen them. They're big, fast, they're physical. Uh, Baldwin over on Maui, they're one of the more balanced teams in the state when you look at the Division II state tournament. However, offensively, they average 200 yards. Defensively, they also give up points at times. Law of Stark, the quarterback for Baldwin, has been pretty solid. 11 touchdown passes, but 11 picks. You can't turn over the ball when it comes to the state tournament. Teams are just too good. Uh, Moana Lua and Iolani, in a lot of ways, this could be a state title game. I mean, th oh, these, yeah. were, these were two of the best teams in Division I all season long. They played in the first game of the year. That game came down to a last-second field goal for the Menehudi. Menehune to win that one. Hilo got the one seed in that. They're chilling this week, so <laughs> they, they got the bye. When you score 100 points, you, you get the first round bye. It's pretty much what they decided. So that'll be good. They're, they're not going to be in action until November 23rd. And in the open division, this Campbell-Kuhuku game is really enticing because to me, I feel like Campbell matches up actually better with Kahuku. Had that been Campbell and Mililani, had Mililani won the OIA, felt like that would have been a little tougher battle. Kahuku is just playing really, really good football right now. Yeah. And this is a team that always peaks at the right time. So Kahuku and Campbell will be a great game. And then you've got St. Louis. They're going to host Mililani, the OIA runner-ups. Uh, I mean, just so much firepower with that team offensively. It's going to be tough for them to lose. Well, well, what do you think about Kahuku? I mean, you're talking about peaking at the right time and, and going back to the basics, right? All season long, they're trying to throw the ball all over the field 
And then right at the last minute, they're like, no, you know what? This is what we do. We run the football. We play good defense. We make you make a mistake, and we make you pay. Yeah, and, and they're just masters at, at making people make mistakes, and not only that, but capitalizing on those mistakes. The OIA championship, the entire game was back and forth, and no one could score. So what happens? Mililani finally breaks through. They go up 3-0. Kuku houses the next kickoff. 96 <laughs> yards to the house. I mean, they just they play big when the moments are big. That's just always been kind of Kuku's bread and butter as a football team. But I really like the matchup with Campbell. I think that's going to be a great physical football game. Campbell, keep in mind, too, is going to be healthy this time around. The first time they played, they didn't have a lot of guys. Pokey Atkins is back. He's one of the best defensive backs in the entire state. He'll be in that game. So that game's going to feature a ton of Div 1 players. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, speaking of one of the best, if not the best, kind of crossing. Oh. All right, guys, thank you so much for that sports update. Hey, and thank you guys for joining us for our first full week of This Is Now on H&N. We're going to be coming to you every day around 11 o'clock here on Facebook Live. Until next week, when Ashley will be back with me, let me take you out live. One more look over our beautiful city on this Aloha Friday. Have a good one.